Wow, what a beautiful day and uh, what a beautiful crowd. You guys are amazing, really good. Um, I, somebody asked me today, how can I help my family to come to Christ? Isn't that interesting? It's a good, good question. We might spend our whole life trying to do that, but the only way that we can help somebody to come to Christ is if they, if they see Jesus in us. It gets to a point where we can't talk at it anymore. They will only see in your actions. I think with kids, it's still like seven, seven years old that you can really tell them and guide them. After that, that's not really, you, you can't push a lot of things, but you can give your example. And having kids really taught me. Oh, no, it didn't teach me about the kids. It teach me about me. <laughs> Self-control. It's a thing, a hard thing. How do we answer? How do we react? So it, I know we all have somebody in our family that have been really against our religion, against our faith. Our way of life needs to be pure Christ. The way we talk needs to be soft. And uh, do you want my help? We don't push. It, it's so complicated. It's so complex. But when we let Jesus do it and help us to be an example and be a light, always be there, always be helpful, he starts to let the people around you's hearts, let their heart not be stone anymore. And it softens. The same way that he will soften your words. Because bad words can come out of us, like really bad. Because people that we live with, they know how to make us angry. They know where to press. And they will test. They will test your patience. They will test your love. They will test your love for Christ. And um, it's always biting our tongue. Huh. A lot of biting, even for our spouse. Because we don't want, if we are picky into every single thing, it's a war. And uh, women has a tendency to nag. Tina was talking about nagging. <laughs> we, we do, we have a tendency to nag. And we don't even pay attention, but that drains our, our vital mental energy. All the little fights, the little control. It can be something so little. Like one lady said, yeah, I used to get so mad at my husband because he wouldn't squeeze the sponge after doing the dishes. Remember? And she, she's a saint of a lady. Yeah. And she's like, I could go all day angry because every time I would get to the kitchen, the sponge was sour and smelly. And uh, things like this can drain us all day. Lord, please help me to pick my fights. What is really important, what really matters, then you waste your energy, your mental sanity. But if it doesn't really matter, buy another sponge <laughs> or throw the sponge in the trash. <laughs> and don't use a sponge, use something else. You know, it's something that will drive us crazy or like squeeze the, uh, the toothpaste. Oh, that my dad. <sighs> Oh, if you squeeze the toothpaste in the middle, we leave it without the cap. You know, when we are little, yeah, you show, so that's how you do it. But after your kids grow up and people in your house grow up, it's difficult. But, you know, 
you have in your own paste. I have my own paste. I don't share my toothpaste with my kids. They have their toothpaste. They squeeze it the way they want. Just don't make a mess there because you have to clean it. <laughs> so uh, how Christ would, how God treats you and to attract you to him is how you will do to attract your spouse to you and your kids to you. Is God pushing you all the time and nagging at you? No. He let us suffer the consequences of our actions. And it gets to a certain point in life where everybody has to learn through consequences. It's hard because we say, I told you so. <laughs> but they need to suffer the consequences and we cannot rescue. We will not say, I told you so either. But we will go like, um, how can I help? <laughs> it's, it's done, but how can I help? I was having trouble with my daughter at school. There's one teacher that she can't stand. And I think the teacher can't stand her either. And um, it's just have been two years of me fighting. And then one day I said, hey, what am I doing? I, I'm fighting. I'm playing my lawyer and my daughter's lawyer. And I can't do that. She's old enough. She's 16. She needs to have her consequences. If she doesn't like the teacher, she will suffer the consequence for not liking the teacher. It's a cycle, right? If you like somebody, we are not born liking people. You know, we have to get to know them and slowly we might like them, but we need to at least be polite. Maybe she's not polite. I don't know how she is when I'm not around. We don't know how our kids act. We don't know how our spouse, we, we don't know. And sometimes we stick ourselves there and we try to, we try so hard to make it work. It's my job to do that? No, my job is to pray and let God do it. So I sat with her and I said, I'm not going to fight your fights anymore. I'm going to pray. I will talk to the teacher that you are having trouble. We will pray. You will be responsible for your actions. Are you rude? She can be rude. Oh, I was, she didn't know I was around. I don't know who that person is, but she can be rude. So, well, maybe she's being rude to the teacher. So I, I pulled up an article that how to be likable. We need to be likable. And how can we help our teachers to like us? And I read that with her and she was like, Ugh. <laughs> and I start letting God fight the fight. What can you do to help your kids? Just pray, just pray that they will be their best, they will show their best, they will fight to be their best, because we fight to be our best. I know you fight to do your best too. We fight for people to like us. We are Christians and we want to help people. We, it's, a, it's a fight. It's a constant, constant war in our mind to bring our mind back, to take control of our actions. Remember, it's, it's in the Bible. It says, guard your mind all the time. And we need to guard our mind, to be praying all the time, to not fight all the time. And you know what happened when I said, Lord, I've been so stupid, <laughs> trying to fight 
this, it, it, uh, forgive me. I, I should, since the beginning, just let you take care of it. Just help my daughter to try to be sweet and not sour. It's a fight. We fight our bad mood. And it's just amazing how things start to get solved. And uh, I think she's more likable. The teachers start to seem more likable. And everything starts to fall in place and harmony. So just keep fighting your thoughts. Keep fighting the, the bad person in us. We have a bad, bad person in us. Remember the Israelites that they want to kill everybody and everything when Elijah blinded the soldiers? That's how bad we can be with no mercy. Good thing we are not judges with God. <laughs> God, God will do a better job than us. And King David, he preferred to fall into God's judgment than man judgment because that was given an option for him. Remember, King David, God asked him, do you want to be judged by man and suffer the consequences by man or by me, by God? And he said, God, Lord, you, because I know you're merciful. Men are not. So, keeping on that fight, we are living the last days. If I die today, today on my last day. Am I prepared? Am I ready? If I find somebody that is their last day on the street, they had an accident, what do I do? What can I do? So a couple of things that I need to prepare you for is that when you find somebody on the street, if the person is awake, you need to ask consent. Amen. Yes, you have to by law. Because they can sue you, especially if you're not in the medic field. Um, so if you find somebody in, in, in the woods or in the mountain or in a park, you first try to see if the person is awake and you say your name and you ask the person's name so you can find out their mental state, their conscience, and see if they want your consent to do something about it. Do you give consent for me to call 911, an ambulance, a helicopter? Whatever it is, <laughs> you need to ask consent. And then a couple of things that we'll, we'll be able to, to look and go through. But what are the top emergencies and problems that you will find when you are alone in the wilderness? And when we say that, we go like, but the United States is populated. We have people everywhere. Oh. No, you go to a national park and we get lost in there. <sighs> days and days. Oh, Tina has paper and pencils, pens here. If you don't have paper. Um, Honey brought it for us. If anybody would like to take notes, does anybody need any pen or paper? If you want the presentation, um, the church has all the presentations. They can email it to you and uh, the booklet also is uh, with the church. They can email that to you. And the, so it's the, and the devotional. And you will find a lot of the things that we are talking about right there in those two books. It, at the end of the booklet, um, God's Pharmacy, there's um, a menu, uh, an example of a menu for you to follow. And if any of you need help, with preparing some food, learn how to do a salad dressing, or learn how to do a breakfast or a lunch or a dinner. You can, ladies that have been plant-based for a long time, can you raise your hand? I will sign you up for helpers. <laughs> so you see the ladies that lift their hands? 
they are great teachers and great cooks. <laughs> um, they can give you recipes and uh, guide you because they suffered already. They know how painful it was to get where they are right now. And they can help you, give you tips in what helps, what doesn't help. So you can look for, is that okay? Yeah, you can um, look for those ladies and gladly, I know they will try to help. Or you can set up um, one, another Sunday and do like a, a quick example of salad dressings or sauce jam, easy things that makes the food taste better. <laughs> um, I just want to say that Dr. Avani is going to be at my church in the Appalachian Mountains the last weekend of May. If you want to come to Floyd VA, we're doing the <laughs> vegan pantry and we're going to have all kinds of food. It's going to be a great getaway and there's uh, cabins there and Everything. So come on up if you want to see her again. Last weekend in May. It's just there. right there, you know, yeah, around the corner. <laughs> it's called the Taste of Health. Lots of good food. All right. So what, what are the emergencies that you will find? Yes. Yes. Yes, it's, it is, um, and we think that, but our, our church was cutting the grass and it was hot. It was about a hundred, a hundred and two degrees. And he said, oh, all of a sudden I feel tired. Huh? And then he started with, Oh, my chest. He's like, oh, I'm having a heart attack. <clears throat> and he had enough strength to crawl out of the little truck and go push himself against the wall in a shade area and call 911. You know what he was having? A heat stroke. It was morning. And just by cutting the grass, so it, it might happen. A friend of mine, she was cutting the grass too, very early in the morning before the heat. And the tractor that she was, uh, she was going too close to the creek and it was muddy and it sank and it flipped on top of her. They live like an hour from a town. Neighbors are like 30 acres far, 50 acres far. Nobody would hear her. Her phone was in the house. Her husband leaves to work at seven, comes back late at night. She couldn't move the truck, the, the, the tractor. She couldn't get out or under. She just stayed there, praying that a wild animal wouldn't come. There was no bleeding. She could see there was no bleeding, but she could feel that there were a couple of broken ribs. And uh, so her husband got home late afternoon and he started looking for her and he's like, mm, something is wrong. And uh, he started looking and he walked and they have uh, 20 acres property. Finally, he found her, but she spent there all day. How, how can we prevent that? It's something that we need to think. We need to always make sure that we have, I don't know, you know, the, the caller that has the emergency. So you press and we'll call 911. So this is something that it's, it's, what can you do? Or my dad, my dad, he is 82 and he thinks he's 19. He goes up the roof. He goes to downtown and he, he, he would do everything by himself. Like, uh, it's crazy. So we got the, the air tag, the Apple air tag. 
and uh, we put that on his keychain, and we keep track of him. <laughs> we need to track him. <laughs> and my brothers have been like really tracking him down in Brazil. And uh, if you tell him something, he'll go, are you trying to control me? Yes. Nobody will control me. No, I'm not taking orders from you. No. Mm -mm. <laughs> so we just adapt, right? And um, it, it, we need to have a, a code with each other. Uh, like if your, your spouse, um, your kids, like, okay, let's track each other. You can share your location with your kids. And if something happens, at least somebody knows where you are. Oh, I can't find dad. Um, I called him and nobody answers the phone. Uh, that's the other thing. He never answers his cell phone because he says that we are trying to control him. I know. He's worse than we were when we were teenagers. <laughs> But we need to have a, a way of communication, or if you live far away, you need to share your location with people at church. Um, how can we meet? Let's say that power goes down and uh, nobody has water, nobody has electricity. Where can we meet? Where can we help each other? It's something that you all need to get together and have a code to keep track of each other. Uh, my brother-in-law, uh, his wife, my, my sister-in-law, she, she just passed. And uh, he's alone at his farm. He lives about 20 minutes from us. So we start to talk to him and say, how can we always know where you are without seeing that we are controlling you? <laughs> and uh, he is 65. But he will always be doing dangerous things. He take care of horses. He cuts the grass. He has a tractor. It, it, that's dangerous. It, when, when we are past our 50s, 55, we are not sturdy anymore like we used to be. We, we will work for it. You know, we will keep on exercising. But 35, things start going down, downhill. 50, a little bit more. 60, a little bit more. So we need to keep that in our mind, that if something happens, do you have a will? You need to make a will. Our church will uh, do the will for you, will help you to do a will for free. Uh, do we have a treasure? Who is the treasure? Is the treasure here? Bob, you're the treasure. Do you know the process, how to do the will with the the conference? You do not? Okay. So uh, maybe somebody can say, I will look into it and help everybody to have a will. Because things can get really complicated. Uh, if you have little kids, and um, that just happened with two friends of mine at church, they got COVID really bad. They are in their 40s. They have two kids. Um, 15 and uh, 13, and both of them were admitted at the hospital, and the doctor said, just a second, do you have a will? And they said, no. What will happen is that the minute we admit you in the hospital, we know you were bad, but the minute we admit you in your hospital, the state will take your kids. And they froze. They were like, oh, yeah, I can't breathe, but I will get a lawyer right now and appoint a guardian. Yeah. That, that happens, and we don't even notice. And then for you to get your kids back, huh, they get separated, and they get into the system till you prove that you're a good parent. They don't want to know why you lost your kids. They just say you were a bad parent, you lost your kids. There, I was in the hospital. You didn't have a will. <laughs> so uh, those are things that we need to get ready. Yes? So the conference here has a fellow who is in charge of trust and wills. It's Pastor Moore who has served the, the congregation here uh, before our conference. Oh, good, good. So do you have a way of contacting him? Call the conference office. There you go. And ask them to have you get in touch. 
Okay. They you not look for you, right? You. Not initiate contact, but if you ask him, he'll get okay. So everybody knows what you do. Yes. Okay. Because it's important. Uh, it's it's really crazy what the state can do to take everything from you and your family. Um, no. Uh. -uh. My dad usually. Uh, he, I grew up listening to this. He said. There are three thieves that we never pay attention to that won't take your money. First, the government. It's true. <laughs> yes. Second, um, your relatives. Third, your friends. So he always put that. I grew up listening to these and, and it's true. When we are used to give money to our kids and one day we say I'm not giving money anymore, they can be bad. <laughs> I've seen it. Yeah. Uh, and push the parents out of the house and yeah, it can, it can be really bad. Yes. Incompetence, like you know, and he was probably, I think, it was like 78, and they wanted to take his property and stuff. So he, he was really upset. So I got the hospital administrators involved and pulled back on that. Wow, it, it, it happens. It's very it happens. Yeah. yeah. That's it. Yeah, it it, so. it, it happens it's more often than than we think. Yeah. It's not cool. But we're only down here for a temporary time. Yeah. <laughs> but just, it's good to be prepared. It is. It's good to be prepared. Sister White says um, over here, she says, become intelligent in regard to disease, how you live. The, um, there is one place that she says, you don't need to follow the news, but it's always good to know what's going on in the world. Always check what is going on right now, financially, with war, with new laws. When she talks about these, she says when they take away the guns, guns are horrible, terrible, but when they take away your right for guns, the Sabbath is in there too. You will not have religious freedom. Yep. So when you, they take away your right to defend yourself, religious freedom is there. And that's the last warning. That's the beginning of the end, end, end. So this is very important. A lot of new laws have, are passing. And they are very scary. Like you cannot run somebody out of your property anymore, even if you have no trespassing signs. That's not just local state law. That's US law. If you have the no trespassing sign, somebody's walking in your property, somebody puts a tent in your property, you can't run them now. You can't. You can't run them off. Isn't that scary? And it's, it's very hidden, it, the words, everything that says there, it's really hard to interpret it, but basically, that's it. That's how Brazil started communism. If you find a house that's empty, like summer houses, winter houses, the person just takes in and you stay there, live there for more than three months, it's not yours anymore. So be aware, don't get angry or anxious or nervous, just be aware, yes.
Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, um, in, in Brazil in the 80s, in the 90s, there was a vote, the UN enforced that, was a vote for guns or no guns, and the whole Brazil vote no guns. So all the guns went to the criminals, because they were the only ones that had access to get the guns. And then communism came really strong. 16 years, and then we had a break for four years, and again we have communism. And it, it, the way, it, it's so satanic, the way they word things, it's, it's horrible. You can really see the traps that Satan is trying to put to really kill people. The same way he did with Jesus, he's trying to kill God's people now. And, do not get depressed about it, worried about it, but be aware. Yes. Look up because your redemption draws nigh. Yes. Things are happening, you should be rejoicing. Uh -huh. Yeah. H have a plan, have a, a bag in your car. Um, I need to do better with that, but I used to have a bag with uh, winter clothes and uh, uh, something little there, uh, first aid, things that I might need. And uh, when I would travel, I take that out and uh, just got in my way, I put it in the garage somewhere. <laughs> just get something, something, a, a little box, because you might be stranded somewhere. Yes, you. Yes, 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 yes. Just go, uh huh. Just go because when people see you with something, they will take it. Yeah. So the only thing you need to go with is Jesus. Make sure you have it. Yeah, and he said, be ready for winter. Yeah. Be ready for excess heat. Be ready for conditions in the road. So if you have a little bag there already that you don't need to run in the house to get it. You can just go. But, but yeah, but let's say it's. Um, yeah. Let's say it's it's a flood. It's here a flood area. Yeah. So let's say it's a flood. You have to go. You just go. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's stealing. Yeah, that, that will happen a lot. A lot of people will just go wild and they start taking it. It started happening already. Yes. Well, there comes a time where you, you can't take anything with you because the Bible talks about that. But there are other natural things that happen to us in our lives. Yeah. Uh, suppose my car breaks down and I'm in the middle of some desert road in Arizona. It could happen. It could happen. Do I Yes. And so, a, a level of preparation for those things that are somewhat likely to happen. Yeah. Is very good. It, it is. It, it's just, it, it's not nothing big that will make you waste a lot of money. Just some old clothes, uh, emergency kit, a first aid kit. 
in, um, in Michigan. I, I don't remember where it was. It was a place up north that it snows a lot. And uh, they had like a, a slide, a landslide in the middle of the road. And both ways stopped and was for like 24 hours, people were sitting on the snow and nothing to do. No, no cars could get to them. And it was this just horrible traffic. And a lot of people died. Their car ran out of gas. A lot of people died. So in the heat, it might happen the same thing. If our car ran out of gas, uh, I was giving this presentation and uh, the elder said, so what you have to do and make yourself as a habit to do that, every time you go out, you put gas. <laughs> every time. So you never run out of gas. Oh, wow, that's a good, good census. Always have gas in your car. That's really good. So become intelligent about diseases. What you do, what natural plants do you have around your house that you may be able to use? How you prepare it? So it's a call to prevent and cure. And those who do these will find a field of labor anywhere. Isn't it amazing? So you don't need to, to do, move mountains to do these. But you can learn how to do little things. Um, we have to become a time when every member of the church should take hold of medical missionary work. It works like this. Do you read the Bible? Did you ever read the Bible? You are a medical missionary. <laughs> Think about it. <laughs> yeah. You are a medical missionary. Do you try to be like Jesus? You are a medical missionary. If you can't do anything else but you can pray, you are doing something already. If you can pray with the person, you are doing missionary work. If you don't know what to do, you can research. You have water as medicine, prayer as medicine, sunlight as medicine. You know how to share those. You know it. You live it. The members of the church are in need of an awakening that they may realize their responsibility to impart these truths. It's heavy. That's really heavy because it, it's hard to do it on ourselves. But once you start, it comes easier and people will be drawn to you and they will ask you questions. By the way, you grocery shop, they will see you. Wow. That person looks good. Look at the whole family. They look good. What they have in their cart? I have so many people coming in and, and looking at my cart. <laughs> and they, they are learning too. What we need to plan, especially if you live in the wilderness. I was hearing from Easy that here you can have some really bad animals, like wild animals. Oh, wow, the javelina? Yeah. <laughs> it's a poor, it's a boar. Oh, okay. it's, how big it is? Oh, I'm scared if I, I see one of those. It, it, they, uh, they attack, right? Well, they don't see very well. So. Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> You've encountered some. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, at where we live, we have bears. And we have the bear trackers, the dogs. They are always running around. When we see the, 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 the trackers, they, they carry those things in their neck. The GPS and all that. It's very high tech. And uh, when we see those around, we're like, ooh, time to see if the chickens are doing well. And uh, <laughs> time to see where the dogs are. And uh, just make sure that everything is okay. The trash, how is the trash? 
so they are not getting into the trash. <laughs> so we need to be ready for things like bad weather, hot or cold, prevent injuring, injuries from lightning strikes. This is like number two, yes. accident. And I, when I was doing these, I learned that golfers, that happen a lot because when they lift the club, they get strike. And if you are working in the field and you lift a tool, <laughs> that can conduct too. And it happens more often than I, I never knew. I had no idea. <laughs> um, so we need to get ready for being caught in the cold water, in the cold weather, or extraneous heat is stranded overnight. Appropriate clothing and food. So how can we get ready for that? What can we find in the wilderness? Frostbite from extreme cold, lightning strikes, poisonous snake, insect bites. Here is the, the scorpions are pretty bad, right? Drowning, wild animal attack, um, contaminated water, so the diarrhea starts, vomiting, dehydration, injuries, like sprain, you're walking and then, ooh, can't walk anymore, or your, your back, you pull the muscle back there, and, oh no, I can't move. Broken bones, scrapes and lacerations, heat stroke, or heat exhaustion. Those are the most common ones. What we need for the basics is have always in your mind, how can you have shelter? Food and water. Am I gonna be warm enough through the night? I thought here would be summer. And Easy texted me and she said, bring jackets. I'm like, really? <laughs> so yeah, then I start looking. Yeah, your, your colds here at night, it gets bad. Wow, I think it's the altitude. It's, it, it, can get, it can get really cold, it can get below freezing at night. Um, so can, can you survive throughout the night? Tools, what kind of tools do I need? And maintain the basics. I, I got um, a little toolkit from Amazon and I was enjoying that so much, but I forgot to take it from my purse and put in my bag at the airport, and they took it. <laughs> I buy another one, it's cheap, but it's, it's like a, a keychain that you have tools there that are very handy. So you can you know, put that in the car, put that around in, in your home, just leave it around. Long term, how can I catch water? Are we gonna have power, heat? Do I have my garden to take care? Do I have livestock? Will they have shelter? Harvest prevention system. So how can you protect your crop? And uh, that's how we'll survive. It's with the food that we are planting. How can we get all that prepared? Um, so, with the, the water and the power and the heat, we have, bless you, we have a lot of hurricanes and tornadoes in Virginia. And uh, the power goes, like, we have a wind, the power is gone. Last one was the one that was a big wake up for me because we were about 10 days without water, without electricity, and it was cold, really cold. And the first night we, we slept at home, we thought it would come back really fast, but it didn't. It took 10 days. 
Then we went to a hotel, but it got, it got pretty cold at night. And uh, we start making a list of things that we had to do. So we got a good generator. We can hook up the whole house in there. But the generator needs gas. So we got an adapter with a propane tank, but I still need filled up the propane tank. Um, so that will work for how many days to run the house? <laughs> um, on lo long term, how can we get better? <laughs> um, we got a little stove. We are working on getting our um, uh, the the firewood the, the wood burner. What's the name of that? Wood the wood stove. And so little things like that, that we need to get ready for and prepared. It's solar, a good idea. How do we hook that up? <laughs> That's another thing that we need to learn. How we can run that from the electricity. You need a special uh, electrician to come to your house. I didn't know that, but that's like $2,000. So the electrician came and he put that there, a switch that you can switch from electricity to whatever alternative you are having there. So things like that, that we need to be, if we don't have it, we need to at least have a plan. And when I was planning with these, they said, have plan A, B, C, D, E, F, Just have plans. <laughs> At least you know what to do. If I don't have the resources, where can I go? Yes. So uh, up where we live in the Appalachian Mountains, we came up with this whole plan because we were living at the beach where all the hurricanes are. We're not there anymore. Um, but, you know, there's storms. And we were planning this farmhouse for a runaway place in case things got bad. But... We were, so we were planning it just specifically for bad times. Well, we did good because we have the wood stove in the winter to heat. It, it heats up the whole house. My biscuits inside, inside the wood stove. We got a big enough one. I can just cook my biscuits or whatever in the morning. Got that. I can cook on the top for a soup in the winter. But in the summer, it's too hot to do that. So step outside on the patio. My husband built one of those old fashioned um, brick oven. So we're gonna have brick oven pizza. I just make the dough. And then right next to it is a rocket stove. So we can cook the beans and the rice and then make the thing. And there you go. And then you use the tripod out there where you have your big fire pit. You can make a big pot of whatever, right? So. And if you use dual fuel, you guys already know this, I know that, but I'm just saying dual fuel, uh, like she was saying with the propane, there you have it. When that time comes, we're not going to be like, oh, let's use all the propane. No, we're going to be like, my husband said, uh-uh. Just when iron, necessary. You can be curling your hair. No, 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 no. You get to use such and such to use your Vitamix, and that's it. That's it. Everything else, forget about it. Pin your hair up, whatever. And it's going to be a different kind of mindset. So the Appalachian people up there taught us, hey, you know, back in the day, it was so hot and sticky. What we used to do is they would drench. There's videos on YouTube about the Appalachian way. And you can get magazine. I mean, you can order the books of how the Appalachian people survived. They had outdoor kitchens. And it was really amazing. But they used to wet their uh, sheets, they would get sheets, and they would dip them in the creek. We have a beautiful creek out there, right? ice cold. And they would hang it on the windows like this. And then they would cut a couple of strips, and it would make air conditioning for the wind. And then they'd go across breeze, come over on this side, dip it in the creek, put it up on this window, cut a couple, just a couple of strips, just enough, and it made air conditioning inside the cabin. So they didn't have so it's very, very interesting how we can do these things. <laughs> yeah, you can look up how um, the ancient used to live around here. Yes. In Arizona, we used to call that swamp coolers. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes we still have them. <laughs> oh, that's funny. Yeah. 
it works. <laughs> yeah. Um, so before we know we are getting out and it's cold, do we have the, the forecast? Can we trust that forecast? I like a website called The Risk. It's um, the, T-H-E, Risk is W-R-I-S-K, The Risk. And he is on YouTube and uh, on Facebook, and uh, he, he's a private forecaster, and uh, he has his, uh, he has access to the four corners of the world um, satellites, and he analyzes it, and uh, big companies pay him to do that, like people that plant and they rely on a forecast to plant or not, and um, pilots, private pilots, truck drivers. So they, they are not mainstream. They, uh, the risk, he is stationed local and he help people a lot. He won't charge you for his forecast, but he does charge big companies a lot. And uh, whatever he says is amazing. It really goes. He, he's able to say when we are having a snowstorm a month before it happens. When nobody else knows, he knows. And you can start getting ready and prepared. He can really point, pinpoint what is happening. It's really amazing. So check your forecast, adjust your schedule to be outside if it's too cold, when it's colder during the day, when it's okay to work in, in your garden, and when it's okay to help your animals, to protect them, your animals have enough water that will keep from being frosted or from being frozen because they can die of dehydration if their water is frozen. Um, fill up the tank. Everything in your house, you can fill up the tank, your tractor, uh, your machines, whatever you need, make sure that it's everything full. You don't know if you need to be inside of your car during the night. It might be very cold. Dress for the outdoors, even if you don't think we will be out much. Yes. <laughs> like, like my friend Cindy. She had, she had a good amount of clothes on her. It, it was summer. But in the mornings are still cold. And you don't want to freeze. The, the earth is very cold. The ground is very cold, especially in the creek area and covered by trees. It can get really cold. So try to dress in layers that if it gets too hot, you can take it off. If it gets colder, you can put one more. Survival kit. Um, if you go on Amazon, you can find kits done already like this. They are expensive, a little, a little bit expensive. If you buy things here and there, you can make your own kit cheaper. You can use this one as a guider, but jumper cables, you might need these. You might have a kit that go in your car and leave the light on all night. Next morning, your car won't start. <laughs> so those are really, really helpful. Flashlights. Never enough flashlights. It's always good to have flashlights. I have little hands at home that the flashlights disappear. Uh, and you go like, where did I leave the flashlight? I don't know. <laughs> First aid kits. Every time you go to the dollar store, get something. Get rubbing alcohol, band-aids, wraps. Get something. And Leave it there, one in the car, one in the kitchen, uh, one in the office, at church, in the, in the kitchen here at church. Always have one. Um, food for baby or family. You can leave it in the car. If, if you have somebody with special needs, 
that need special medication, special care, try to have a little bag. Like I said, I got tired of the, the bag, but maybe you can find a way of not getting tired of the prep bag. <laughs> um, water. So what I've been trying to do now is to get the life straw bottles. So it's charcoal. So you fill up the bottle and you put the cap on it and you close it really well. And then there is like a straw in the middle and all the water that you will suck on for the water to come, it will go really, really slow because the charcoal will filter the water. And it can filter around 98, 99% of bacteria. So if you don't want to carry a case of water all the time in the car because of the heat, you can have live straw bottles that you can drink water from the creek. It's dangerous, I know, but it will filter. The charcoal will filter. Um, a basic toolkit, a radio, make sure that you can hear the news and what's going on, because sometimes we don't have cell phone coverage in the highway or in places that we go. Uh, national forests, if you're going on a hike, they usually don't have cell phone coverage, especially if you have trees. Um, the ice scrapers, pliers, tools, cat litter or sand. I don't know, do you guys have snow here? Yeah, if your car gets stuck, you put under the wheels, you put cat litter or sand that it will have grip and your car will be able to get out of there. Yeah, we do that. We also carry chainsaws in our, baby chainsaws in our cars because you never know when you're driving there's a road down, you can't fall, somebody's stuck on the other side, cars are backed up, all the men in the mountain get out. In their they have their chainsaw, yeah, that's right. They divide up the wood and make friends and... <laughs> um, clothes. Gloves, hats, boots, jacket, everything that's impermeable, like water protected. Uh, being cold with wet feet is not fun. <laughs> um, blankets, sleeping bags. So this is just in case you go on a trip and you never know what will happen. If you want have that in the car, that's good. How you can dress if you work on your farm, you need to have the very strong, the, the car, cart, cart. how you say that, cart, cart? Cart, cart are really excellent. They are usually impermeable and uh, they will protect you from the wind and um, if it's too hot, they will be with a good layer of insulation inside that will help you to be cool. And if it's too cold, it will also help you and you can dress in layers. So try to get everything water protector and um, make sure that you have something. You don't need a lot of those. If you have two pair of pants and one good jacket, that's good. We have the levels of hypothermia when the, we, let's say that you are working outside and you get injured, because while we are working, we have, you know, the heat. But once we get injured and we have to sit down, we can't keep moving, the temperature can drop really fast. So the way, the way it starts is that we start with shivering, hypotension, and then stage two, the skin starts to change, the lips, the color of the lips start turning blue. We have confusion, loss of agility, like our hands start to be frozen. And the three, it's like you are really lethargic. So you have to um, kind of know if you find somebody, which stage of hypothermia they are, or if you are going through, how fast can you get help? Um, for heat, if you have to work on your garden, make sure that your head is always cool. You are working there and it's hot, 
grab your water hose and pour water. And then close the water, keep working. So every 10 minutes, 20 minutes, you can do this. It works. That's what I do when I have to work in Virginia summer <laughs> outside in the garden. Sometimes we, we can't postpone grabbing the things and, and collect, harvest. You need to be in that heating sun. There's no way. So protect yourself. Long sleeves, cotton fabric that your, your skin can breathe through. Always long sleeves, long pants, boots. Learn how to always have your boots on. Always have your boots. Mm, never, you never go outside without your boots. Do not work in your garden without your gloves. Mm. I have horrible experience with, ah, uh, it can be bad. And if you're pulling weeds, you, you, sometimes you rub something, ooh, this is poisonous. And, uh, uh, yeah, you can have a, a reaction right there. But the boots, I was getting berries, wild berries, and um, I looked down and it was moving. <laughs> it was a snake. It was poisonous. I didn't know how high I could jump back, but it was pretty amazing. <laughs> I had my boots on, but if it's hot, I like to be on my flip-flops. And we can really injure our feet. And if we get an inflammation, and if we get like a, a, a rusty um, nail that go, oh, you, you don't want to go there. You don't want to go there. The, the, the rusty metal can really infect us really fast and the infection goes fast. But you know what to do if that ever happens. So try to be always with water around you, with water in your head and with your clothes because it's hot. Do not take your clothes off. Never wear shorts, uh, the spaghetti um, straps, the, the shirts, spaghetti straps. Always cover your skin. It seems that you will be hot, but no, it has the opposite effect. If you have a white cotton t-shirt, it will help you to keep cool. If you take off, then you will be really hot. So try to have a hat, something that will protect your neck too, and your ears. I got sunburn on my ears, it's not fun. Um, try to have covered, everything covered. And some pants that if you are working with a chainsaw, it will not go through your leg. Oh, we have a lot of those in Virginia, yeah. Um, so we, we think we can handle that, but once our arm get tired, we can drop that and can be a disaster. So many friends of mine went through my husband, he, he got from work early. I didn't know he was home because he took the truck and he was in the middle of the woods. He was clearing from after a storm. We had a lot of trees fell down. He was there working. He didn't pay attention to the time. And uh, he was there for like four hours. And he said that his hands got really tired and it, it just failed. And it, it cut the jeans. He had jeans on. It didn't do anything to the skin, but he was exhausted. And uh, the, only new, the only way he told me was because I was like, what happened to your jeans? And he wouldn't answer. What happened to your jeans? <laughs> Finally, he said, oh. So we get tired and exhausted. So take breaks and make sure you have your water and 
you know, you know how to protect yourself and use your senses. Um, but try to always have water, keep cool clothing. When you start to feel nauseous and vomiting, you're dehydrated. You're very close to have a heat stroke. Yes. One of the first um, signs of dehydration is nausea and vomiting. When it gets to that point, we need to stop, go inside, get water, one tablespoon of honey, a dash of salt, mix really well, drink, that's your Gatorade. <laughs> without anything bad on it, without food coloring. Do you need the recipe again? No, everybody knows, right? Uh, so a cup of water, a spoon of honey, a dash of salt. Um, your skin will start to be flushed, rapid breathing, your heart will go really fast, and your head will hurt really, really hard. So first thing you do if you find somebody, try to get that person in a shade, remove clothing, um, I was, it, it was early in the morning, I was at my kids' school, I'm their PE teacher for my kids' school at the Richmond Academy, and the kids were running, I said, let's try to do the 10 minutes run today, it wasn't hot at all, and it, there was one girl there that she had a lot of clothes on, and I'm like, so the first run, you know, if you start getting too hot, start taking your clothes off and you have layers, you have your uniform under. And she said, no, I'm good. And she kept going, she kept going. By the end of the 10 minutes, she was like, oh, I need to sit down. And she sat and she fell. And she just stayed there. And we were like, okay, let's go. And she's like, oh, I, I, I feel horrible. It's like everything is turning around. So we moved her inside of the school. She started cooling down, but that feeling wouldn't go away. And I said, you know what? Let me look. Start taking her shoes. She had heavy, heavy socks on. They were really warm. And her pants inside had the fuzzies. And so she was overheating. And you will pass out. That's what was going on with her. So try to remove the excess clothing. Let's try to cool that person down with water, in a cool tub of water, in a shower, with the, the garden hose. Um, try to get the neck cold under the armpit, the belly, and the groin area. Immersion in cold water, and if you are in the back country, you need to find a stream, a shaded area, and um, that's when you can use clay to cool it down. Have you seen the dogs, what they do when it's too hot? Yeah. They dig a hole, and they will put themselves in that hole and put dirt yeah. all over them. Uh, I took my dog to the beach, it was too hot for them and they would dig holes and cover and just stay the little nose out. <laughs> and that way you can cool down. Striking. This one, do you have a lot of storms here? <sighs> and a lot of golfers, right? I've seen that in the airport. Pretty much everybody in the airplane had their huge things of golf. <laughs> um, so what can you do when it, it's eminent? You know it's gonna strike you. Your hair goes up. And if you have that feeling, there's nothing around you, you need to do like what he's doing. You will put yourself in like a little ball and the minimal contact with the ground. So you try to go down like this on your toes and just make yourself very little. Hopefully it will attract, uh, be attracted to something else around you. Um, we have several ways of striking. 
And um, the direct strike is the worst one. We also have the electricity. If you don't know anything about electrical work, do not touch it. If it's an old house and you don't know much about the electrical work, it might have two switches, half of the house with one, half of the house with the other one. You think you turned off? That happened to us. You think it's all turned off, but it's not. So if you don't know what you are doing, don't do it. I ask somebody at church that knows about electricity, hire somebody, it's better than going through that. Your heart can stop. Yes. <laughs> oh, yeah, that will conduct. If, if you see the clouds coming and you are outside a church cutting the grass, just go. You can come back and do the grass another time. The Lord will, will not be angry at you for not cutting the grass that day. <laughs> um, it, it happens a lot. Um, if, if you are working around here and uh, do you have electricity poles or is it underground? I didn't notice outside. How is it? Overhead. Overhead. If you start coming to church and you see one of those on the ground, don't even come. Go, stop the traffic. Let's get that take care first. You can call um, the county. They will come and help or the electrical company. Do not try to do anything. Now, if you need, if somebody is in there, on the ground and you need save, you can do something about it, but first you need to know if that is not hot, if they turned it off, it needs to be off. Usually the ones on the street never go off. <laughs> They're always hot. And uh, the striking will mark our body and that stays Forever. Yeah. It. Are you going to touch on if, you're, if somebody does hit an electrical thing, how to remove them from that? Yeah. Good. <laughs> um, so it will do a skin injury, like you can see, head injury, um, the person will pass out. It will injure the heart. Our heart works with electrical signals from our brain. And we have our own electricity channels right here in our heart, making it pump. So we, we have electricity in ourselves too. So that will affect the heart. It will stop the heart. Ear and eye injuries, um, we will have paralysis. We will lose the feeling of your skin for a while. Spine injuries, broken bones, nerve injury, numbness, tingling. So what can you do if you find somebody there? First, you need to make sure that that is not hot, it's not on. Usually is. If it is, don't go there. You can't. It, this is painful because it might be somebody there that you really want to save. But if you go there, the, the ground is transmitting electricity. And we'll be transmitting electricity till somebody comes and cuts it off. Um, if the person you found is unconscious, you can try to do CPR. The CPR now changed. We do not do mouth to mouth. You don't have to do mouth to mouth. With the whole COVID thing, they discovered that if you just do the heart compressions, it's good enough. You don't need to do the mouth to mouth. So you can start doing the heart compression. Do you guys have a CPR person that come here often to give you 
courses, that's something that you all need to get your certification. It's, it's important. Yeah, or, or even at church, we might have some, something happening. Um, so I will talk about electrical shock. It's in the next slides. Um, what do you do if you are bitten by a snake? Don't try to recognize the snake or to catch the snake. The doctor probably won't know what a snake that is, or they will not know how to help you. If there is no way that you can go to a hospital or to go to urgent care because you can't move and you're alone, but clay. Always you have dirt there. If you have a little water, water bottle, try to mix that with clay. If you have charcoal, great, mix all that and cover yourself with clay and charcoal. If you don't have anything, you have dirt, and you can at least make a little hole, cover yourself in that dirt. At least you'll be protected from the wild animals and um, you, your body will start to react with the clay. Even if it doesn't have water, it will react. Um, so there are a couple of repellents that you can have around your house, planted around your house, and you can make a, a, a mixture of oils, and every time you go out, you can spray that on your boots, or on yourself, in your body, in your clothes. But snakes do not like cedar wood, peppermint, plant peppermint everywhere, and they will grow like a weed, a good weed. <laughs> um, lemon eucalyptus, lemongrass, tea tree oil, cinnamon, citronella, lavender, sweet orange, and spearmint. Snakes don't like that. Um, they don't like onions and garlic either. So if you can, and most pests that attack the garden do not like them either. So plant around your garden garlic, onions, a couple of Plants do not like onions. So try to see the companion plants and uh, plant the, the onions where they will like it. Um, but you can do like an oil, a mixture of oils with clove, eucalyptus, tea tree, lavender, and sandal, sandalwood. And that before you go out, you have that sprayed. Um, in Virginia, I would drive around in the mountains and I would see that the houses had an ugly blue light under and, and on, on the bottom of the house. Like everywhere in the house, they had this ugly blue light. It's a, 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 a blue that hurts your eyes, like neon. And I said, why they do that to their house? Their house is so pretty and has that ugly light. It has a reason. They know why. They, they are really smart uh, with their environment. And these snakes don't like that light. And the rats, they don't like that, that light either. So that's why they want to keep the pests out without having to use chemicals in their house to keep them out. 
and rats and mice and uh, snakes, they are everywhere. We are invading their territory. <laughs> oh, I, I got so upset when I moved through the country and I found mice. I was angry. I said, but I'm so clean. How can I have mice? <laughs> and uh, I called the, the pest control guy and he's like, ma'am, you live in the country. What do you want? <laughs> you will share your house with the mice. <laughs> Get a cat. Go around the house, cover the holes, but you are in their habitat. <laughs> um, so what, what else can you do for a snake bite? Drink charcoal, because you need a huge amount of charcoal, you will get a big jar and you put two or three tablespoons of charcoal there. Mix very well, let that sit. And then you drink just the water. You can pour the, just the water in a cup and you start drinking it and drink that a lot. Do not drink the charcoal because if it's a huge amount like that, it will clog you up. And you don't want to be clogged with charcoal. It can be really bad. Um, so just drink the water. If it's just a little bit because you have a stomach ache, it's fine. But a huge amount, it will be bad. So drink a lot of charcoal. If, if you really don't have how to go somewhere, put a lot, the charcoal in the tub and soak there for a long time. You can apply activated charcoal, bentonite clay, apple pectin, and turmeric powder. And every six hours, you can change, do something different. If it's just clay, you can only stay with the clay for two hours. And then you need to throw that away and put another one. But the clay, only two hours. And anywhere in your body that you want to use clay, you need to apply in the belly too in the whole area. So let's say you have a problem in your elbow and you want to put clay there, you can, but put in your belly too. Because the clay will pull the infection. And the best way to get the infection in a place to get out fast is the intestine. If you put that just in the elbow, your whole body will try to clean through that area and it will, the infection will be big. It will clean, but it will get really painful before it gets better. Make sense? Yeah? So we want all the toxins to be drawn to our belly because that's easy way to excrete it. We want the, the urine to be out. We want number two to be out. We want everything out. Um, protect yourself from wild animals. Do you know what to do if you find a brown bear, a grizzly, a black bear? I did just learned that they are all different. They are. And they react different. Do not play dead. <laughs> they, they don't fall for that. Uh, so this is the brown bear attack every year is about 70 people get attacked. Sharks, 57. If there is a, a, a slight, a very small chance of the water you are going in has sharks or alligators, don't go, <laughs> don't go. They can come to very shallow water. We had some in Virginia, we never had shark attacks, but uh, maybe two years ago, they were there. And they were attacking very shallow water. Snakes, 57. Black bear, 54. Alligators. A lot of, we always hear on the news that in Florida, they are getting kids. Uh, Colger, or the, the wild, the wild big, big kitties. <laughs> Polar bear, wolf, um, the main thing is make a lot of noise. They don't like noise. Scream. If you have the horn, 
Use the horn. There is a, a horn, a horn, hornet. First, I didn't really realize, I'm from California, you know, and I didn't really realize all that I was supposed to do, so I was walking around, and man up on the mountain said, hey, little Missy, you come here. Where's your gun? And I said, uh, I don't have a gun. He said, you don't have a gun? Where's your bear horn? I said, bear what? But, huh? He said, you need to get yourself a bear horn, honey. So he got me a long stick, and he said, you need to make yourself tall. You just prop that thing on yeah. your shoulder, you know, like those old fishing poles. You just prop that up on your shoulder like this, and you hold on to it tight because it can fall down. And then you beep your horn with like this, beep, 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 beep. And then if you have to, you pull out your pepper spray or you pack your glass. <laughs> just one shot won't do. <laughs> some of the ladies up there in the mountain, one, one woman we went to a picnic, uh, they say that um, there's not a lot of mountain lions anymore and this and that, mm -hmm. but it's a fallacy. She said that she just saw a mountain lion. She said, what? I just saw a mountain lion take my goat. He had my goat in his mouth. I was yelling at that mountain lion. I said, what? I can believe these stories. You know, I'm like from California. I'm like, honey, I can't live here. Take me back to Virginia Beach. And you know what? She said, he dropped my, I was yelling at him, he dropped my goat. But my goat was dead. <laughs> I was like, there's mountain lions. Oh, great. Yes. Um, I lived in Scottsdale. And it was on the, a little bit further out, kind of against the mountain. And my dog needed to go out in the middle of the night. And I took him out. And on a truck in the parking lot, there was a big mountain lion laying on the hood of the truck. Right there, I mean, you just have to be aware, always, always aware. It doesn't matter where you are. <laughs> it can be in your porch. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. <laughs> just dozing. <laughs> uh, just so you know, I saw on the, I was, because when I heard that story, instantly I'm on YouTube, right? What do I do if I'm walking? And I'm kitty kitty, right? And so <laughs> this guy said, whatever you do, it's different than the bear. Okay. So what you do is, you do not, as soon as you turn your back on that kitty, they you, are, jump, prey. you yeah. are prey. So they said, you drag your feet. You drag your feet and you make, put your hands big, shake your hands and drag your feet. But don't fall because once you fall down, you are prey. <laughs> they will land on you. Go for the juggler, your history. So the guy said, do your feet and go backwards. <laughs> go away, kid, go away, go away. And I can't remember. Now, if you're supposed to look him in the eye or not look at him, <laughs> look that up. But which one of them? I need to look that up. So anyway, now, don't turn your back. And you just... Very unpredictable. Very unpredictable. Yeah. They don't play by the rules. No. Don't look at the bear, that's what they do. Um, with a bear, okay, so <laughs> you guys are going to think this is crazy, and that's a very good question. Because um, we have big old huge 400-pound bears with their big... I, when we first got up there, I was out in my backyard, and here comes this, my puppy's hair was standing up like a mohawk, and I'm like, what's the matter, what's the matter? And I look, and here, it, I saw the, the bushes, and here comes the bear. He's looking at me, I'm looking at him, I'm like, okay. And then what did I do? I did everything you weren't supposed to do. Yeah. I screamed, and I ran to go get my puppy, <laughs> and then I'm running with my puppy, turned my back, and I'm running. Did everything and I was telling him, oh, there's a bear. And he's like, oh, you're crazy, woman. And then he went, hey, there's a bear. Let's get the <laughs> video cam. But now we see them coming all the time. And I talk to them and I can smell them. They are close and they're big, 400, 500 pounds, big guys. But I talk to them and I pray and I say, Lord, do not let me be dinner. <laughs> I'm asking you now ahead of time. Tell them that it's Tina. <laughs> and I tell them, I see you. I hear you. You can't come around here. This is my land. And I can hear them going like this. Uh -huh. You know what that is? Look it up. The clacking of the jaws, which means 
they're having an attitude with you. Mm -hmm. Hey, this is my land. And I'm saying back to them, no, it's my land. So sometimes you can let them know. And I mean, like, I don't know. It's like they kind of understand and go off. Mm -hmm. So before you enter outside, you're supposed to clank your pans, make a lot of noise, have some chimes around. But if you're in the wilderness and God has said, sent you an angel like Joseph and said, hey, dude, you got to go. And you're out there in these mountains, pray ahead of time. Tell the kitty, I'm nice. <laughs> Tell the bear, I'm their friend. <laughs> I bet. And that's, you know, I'm out, Encounters. I'm out there by myself backpacking and sometimes with my dog. But, um, yeah, it's really scary. And I have hiking poles, so I'll take them and put them above my head and clank them and, you know, go away, go away, and be big and... Yeah, you have bear spray, you have all of that, and sometimes it doesn't help, but... You know. Yeah, but they do not like noise. Nope, so don't. all the noise you can make, the, all the annoyingness you can do, do it. And um, prayer will help. The thing is that when we face an encounter, we get so scared. We don't know what to do. We forget everything. It's like, Lord... Please help me when I'm scared. <laughs> yes. Oh, yeah, avoid eye contact. It's right there. Um, so it says in the first one, get inside of a car. Did you see that YouTube video that the bear opened the car? Yes. Did you see that one? <laughs> he, opened, he opened the door. Inside your house, too. Yeah. The lady showed the video when they were inside the house. Uh-huh. They're getting smarter. <laughs> but remember, God's going to be sending the angels for us. And, you know, he made the donkey talk. He can make the bear say hi. Um, in, in Texas, a boy was lost from his backyard. Remember that? Yeah. A three-year-old. He was playing in his backyard. And his mama went inside to get something, came back. Where is my son? He was lost for a long time. And when they finally found him, he had food. And he said at night, a fluffy thing would protect him. So the angel of the Lord provided a bear or a wolf or whatever, yes. and it kept that little thing alive. Amen. The Lord will, yes. he has a way. He has miracles. And everything is for his glory and his honor. He will protect you, but we need to be aware. <laughs> yes. Oh, there's a little keychain thing that you can buy. It's called the burn, but they have cheaper ones on Walmart or Amazon where you just put your phone into your keychain. Yeah. And it's a like really loud siren. That's mm -hmm. good. It's used for, you know, pepper spray for where they make the toys. It's called the turkey chain? No, it's that's called the uh, birdie. The birdie. The birdie, huh? That's, um, that's good to know. Amazon? That's good to know, good to have. If you're going and hike, if you're working in your backyard and uh, in the parking lots, yes. It's, it's wild. And where I live is, is wild. Where, where you live here is wild. <laughs> And uh, some, some people say, I, I used to be very carefree in this subject. When a church asked me to prepare that subject, I'm like, the Lord will protect. But then something started to really bug me. The story of Gideon, when they were drinking water. It's like the Lord is telling me, oh, you are carefree. You say the Lord will provide, the Lord will protect, and you are not getting prepared. You will be caught mm -hmm. yep. in trouble yes. that you could prevent. So how were they drinking water? <clears throat> they were drinking water and looking around. <clears throat> if we are careless, 
difficult situation will come and if we if at least once in our life we thought about it you know what to do but if you never cared for it you will not know what to do now at least you are looking at it and uh, the lord can help you to do something <laughs> or he will do something but at least be aware uh, wolves do you have wolves here we have coyotes coyotes yeah i think wolves is more up uh, very cold in the forest yeah they also have co-wolves now it's a different variation of it's a 50 50 bar mm. so it's a half, mix half coyote half wolf because they're intermixing yeah they they are coming back um, uh, very heavy in Virginia. There was a time where they thought that they would go in extinction, but they're coming back. That everybody can, if you see one, you can shoot them. It doesn't need to be hunting season. And the deer, too, if, if they are open for deer uh, because they are destroying everything. And um, so, what do you do when you see one? Don't run yell, make noise, start a lot of shouting, do not lose your footing, like Tina said, you, you know, make sure that you know where you're stepping in the back. And if it's imminent, you get attacked, try to hurt where it's really painful. And you know, uh, where is really painful? The nose is really painful, um, the throat, um, the eyes, and uh, those will, make them go back but just try to defend yourself the best you can and you know when you know when king david he was found in the, uh, another king's land and the king was really mad because he thought the king david was coming to his land to take over his town so when they brought him he ran through the city like a crazy man he was foaming of the mouth those are survival modes that we can learn how to do. If, if it's an imminent attack, it's a person that is attacking you, it's an animal, act crazy. That will at least scare the person. <laughs> and, uh, it, it, something. You, you, at least you do something. Um, the difference between gray wolf or a coyote, I don't want to know the difference. If I see one of those, you know, we find shelter. What can we do if we got sick in the wild? Uh, the drink, we drink water that was contaminated or we ate something that gave us diarrhea. So if you have charcoal with you in your backpack, it doesn't take a lot of charcoal. Um, two things that I, th I think they're really important for us to always have is a baby aspirin, a baby aspirin, a little bit of charcoal, and a little bit of cayenne pepper. Um, a man was at Cartersville Church, and all of a sudden they were singing, he put his hand in his heart and he collapsed. The man on this side, grabbed from his, he had a, a little pill pocket, tiny one that he put in his keychain, had cayenne pepper there. He opened the man's mouth and threw cayenne pepper there. So what that will do is that it will trick your body and circulation will start. Your body will forget that the person, that you are having a heart attack and circulation will start. And it's so painful, like it burns so much, that at, that we will start the heart. Yes? Right. Um, um, I think you have to put it under the tongue. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. If, if you have time, if it's, if it's on yourself, you have time, put it under your tongue. But if it's an emergency, somebody's collapsing, the man was unconscious. They just opened, the way they could open his mouth, they throw that there, and he came back. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's better than dying. <laughs> yeah, we're not thinking about hurting, we're thinking about living. <laughs> yeah, good, good point. Under the tongue. If you have time, put it under your tongue. But if you don't have time, just that will save. 
a person's life. And um, if you have diarrhea, charcoal water will do. If you don't have charcoal, then a couple of herbs into the wild that will help. Those are mainly Virginia, but do you, do you know what to do in case of diarrhea? No? So let's say you are at home and you are having heavy, heavy diarrhea. We don't want to stop the diarrhea because your body is trying to get rid of the poison. If it's a bacteria, your body wants to get rid of it. If you stop the, the diarrhea, you might have a major infection, sepsis. So what we do is make sure that we are hydrated. So we will start eating a lot of oranges, drinking a lot of orange juice. If you have diabetes, you will drink another juice like green apple juice or a juice that has low sugar. Um, you have frozen strawberries, blend frozen strawberries with water and you start to hydrate, hydrate. If you have little kids, you put rice to boil and uh, once it start boiling, you get that water and give that water to the kid. That will give enough um, carbohydrate to keep well hydrated while feeding the cells of the body. It will give energy. Um, if you don't have anything but you have water and you have um, honey and salt, you can do the Gatorade that I, I taught you. One spoon of honey, a dash of salt, and that needs to come in a lot. Just make sure that you are hydrated. She gave that recipe to my daughter when she was in Honduras just recently. My daughter was uh, spent two, two months in the middle of nowhere, like the worst mission trip, dirt floors, no refrigeration, the toilets don't work. I mean, there's no flushing, wiping and sticking in the trash can. Anyway, it was horrible. And my daughter ended up getting so sick the parasites, and I immediately called her, and she's like, tell her this, and the rice, and the da 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 and I talked to my daughter, and I said, this is what you gotta do. She was making it for everybody, because everybody had diarrhea, and it worked. <laughs> um, when cholera was taking over South America, um, a, lot of, a lot of people were dying. Did, did it affect here too, cholera? No? Uh, we had like horrible, horrible problem with cholera. It's like a, a diarrhea that can, can advance really fast into bloody diarrhea. Oh, yeah. And uh, it, it, the person died really fast in like hours. So there's this one place where uh, a nun, she discovered, I think God told her, that if you keep hydrating instead of cutting the diarrhea, because people were dying, they were stopping the diarrhea, and then would go into internal bleeding. So instead of giving medicine, she put a huge pot to boil with, because the water was contaminated. So she put a huge pot to boil of water, and she put honey in that water and salt, and she stirred, and after boiling, she let it cool down, and she would have the person drinking that non-stop 24 hours. And that hydration kept everybody in that town alive. From cholera. From cholera. Yeah, would decimate whole towns, villages, everybody would be gone. Um, some herbs that will help, they will not stop diarrhea, but they will help to keep you hydrated and with nutrients. Um, here, there's another recipe for um, Gatorade or hydration. 
It's half cup of orange juice, a quarter cup of lemon juice, two cups of water, two tablespoons of raw honey, one eighth teaspoon of sea salt, mix well, and drink. So if you are dehydrated, if you are working outside, if you have diarrhea, that's a good medicine. First aid basics. If you are trying to save somebody, first thing, is that safe to go? Is the wild animal is still there? What caused the injury, the accident? Because you might put yourself in risk. Is a landslide? It's more coming down? Was a tree? Was an accident? Was an animal? Was electrical? So try to see the surroundings. Is it safe? And then, if you put yourself in risk, whoever will come to save you will have two persons to save. Um, and that person's only uh, resource could be you. So you don't want to put yourself in risk because then you die and that person will die too. So you want to make sure that it's safe to go there. Um, identify the mechanism of injury look what may cause it, have a general impression of the situation, how got injured, why is sick, how is sick, has cuts, lacerations, concoction, protect yourself. If you have gloves, if you have mask, wear them, wash your hands after if you didn't have any, any gloves, we don't carry gloves around, <laughs> do we? we? We don't, but um, if you find yourself in that situation, just know that the blood, the person that you will be touching, it might be contaminated. Obtain consent to treat. Find if the person is conscious, if they need help. It might be just taking a nap. <laughs> and if they say yes, say your name and uh, try to ask them what happened. Establish if it's responsive, and if, how well can the person think? Like, do you know what, which day is today? Do you know what happened to you? That way you will know how bad the person is, the, the mental state. You do the A, B, C, D, E. You will check, is the person breathing? Are there airways? clogged. Sometimes something happens and the tongue rolls up and it blocks the airways. So how can you help that? How can you, you can fix the neck. And um, what we do is, uh, this is funny, but you can take the shoe string from your shoes or you can get a rubber band and you will tie the person's tongue pull it out and try to tie to the clothing so the tongue will stay out of the airway. It's, it's interesting, but that will prevent from the tongue rolling back. Is turning the patient on the side do as well? We still need to check if it's breathing, if you need to check if it was a neck injury, because if you move the person, it might, yeah, you may cut the spine, yeah. Um, the disability, how bad it is, expose injuries. Is it bleeding? Is it breathing? Is it um, with a head trauma? Is it a neck trauma? A few things you will you will be able to evaluate when you look. And the only way you will know is because you are learning it now. And believe it or not, this will come back to your mind when you see yourself in that situation. Even if it's on you, you will know how to evaluate and what to do. So is it a spine, head injury? Is the person in shock? If it's in shock, it's not responsive at all. Wounds, infection, burns, blisters, 
bone exposure, soft tissue injuries, heat exhaustion. How you know it's heat is the exhaustion. You know a lot of clothes and it's really hot. Hypothermia, frostbite, altitude, altitude. Ooh, that's a real thing. Um, it, it can happen uh, when I went to Machu Picchu. It's, it's really high and uh, you can collapse. Like, like nothing, you feel kind of good, you don't feel good at all, but kind of good, and you are walking and yep. <laughs> collapse. It's the lack of oxygen. Um, it's lightning related, is an allergic reaction, chest pain, shortness of breath. How is the mental state, is status? So if it's head injury, is spinal cord injury, the person will not be able to move. If it's cervical, will not move. The injury will happen right here. So the whole spine, it's not working anymore. It's not responding anymore. So from the neck, from the head down, won't be working. If it's thoracic, from the arms down, will not be working. If it, it happened in the lumbar, sacral, it will be the legs how you know when the head got injured, you will see bruises in the face. You see bruises in the eyes, we'll have uh, blood coming from the nose, blood coming from the ears, and um, you will really fast kind of tell what hit that person in the head. If something happened in the spine, you need to be very careful how to move that person. If you don't have anything handy, you can get sticks, clothing, whatever you find, and you can make something to carry that person to safety. And just uh, as a point, you never want to just move a person just, if it's a really serious situation, like you gotta go quick, Just move. Just move because it's a matter of life or death. Otherwise, you always move them as a unit. Okay? Just remember that. As a unit. So, as an example, um, a nurse is at the hospital. They have an elderly patient laying here. They are paralyzed. And you got to change the bed sheets. Well, how are you going to change the bed sheets with them in the bed? So, what we used to do is... You know, back in the day, you just put the sheet down, but you move them as a unit. They are a unit completely. So you support the head first. Then you move them as a unit. The arms then always move together. Them on the other side, you lift up as a unit. Pull that little sheet all the way, just kind of work it underneath. Then you have them underneath. So now somebody can get on that side, somebody can get on this side and you can move them. Now you've got the sheet, who's in the middle? The person. Now you can move as a unit. You see what I'm saying? So the body is a unit, you're moving the, you're moving the body as a unit. Rolling the body as a unit. Less on the spine. So once you have the person in a way that you can carry uh -huh. the person, make sure that feet, hands are always together if it's flipping around, you tied it up. <laughs> Sometimes the person uh, will lose their mind and they will start to react. So if you have the person like a burrito, that will help to at least know it's safe. <laughs> um, if there's nothing around that you can do, but you have sheets or you have a tarp in the back of your truck, you can move that, like we move leaves. Um, if you have a chair, you can use that. If you have ropes and you, you have two sticks, you can move that over there. You see how, how he did it? But two, sti two sticks right there and one to hold it. If you don't have ropes, some, some kind of 
tree or branches or something will be flexible enough to hold that together. Um, if it's a broken arm, the first thing we have to know is did the blood circulation stop? So we find swell, swollen, it's everything swollen, is bruised, and the tip of the fingers are turning blue, and then black. What do you do? You know, it's, circulation is cut by the cut, by the, the yes. broken. So try to immobilize and uh, take to a hospital or um, if it's really, really bad, you can put charcoal, you can put clay, you can't go anywhere. At least try to immobilize with a splint like they did right here. You can use pieces of wood, you can use um, duct tape. They say that if something that you're trying to fix didn't get fixed, it's because it doesn't have enough duct tape. <laughs> so duct tape is good for everything. Yeah, you can even hold like the splinter there together. But if you do it too tight, you can kill a person. <laughs> yeah. Remember that. Yeah, it's, um, if, if the color of the hand or the leg start to change, you know it's too tight. Like when you put Band-Aid, when it's too tight, it's, oh, this is tight, then you loosen up. Um, what to do if somebody, you need to save somebody that just got exposed to a big, big discharge of electricity. So make sure that your shoes are rubber and they are tall. Uh, throw something in there to see if it's still hot you will be able to tell. And um, if it's still hot, just wait for the company to get there. Um, we have a lot of electrical injuries. When we are trying to plug, it can... Um, now they are having a lot of cell phones that have been exploding when you plug and you leave all night. It has been exploding. Apple never happened till not long ago. It started to happen in shoes. So uh, do not leave all night near your head, near, near, in the bed. Just make sure that it's, you can at least unplug if you see smoke coming. Um, it will cause severe burns, confusion, difficulty breathing. The heart will beat different can guide to cardiac arrest, muscle pain, seizures, loss of conscience. Do not touch the injured person. Get a stick, try to remove the cord, just you don't know if it's on. Um, call for help. Do not get near high voltage wires until the power, the power is off. Stay at least 20 feet away. Don't move the person with electrical injury unless the person is in immediate danger. So you can leave the person there. If you can notice the person is breathing, just leave the person there till more help comes. Yes? Oh, yeah, it, it can really cook our flesh inside. And we don't even know it, don't even see it. Um, so what can you do? What is safe? Turn off the source of electricity if it's possible. If not, move the source away from both of you and the injured person using a dry, non-conducting object, like cardboard, plastic, or wood. Begin CPR if the person shows no sign of circulation. So you can touch right under the neck. Yes. Yes, you just do the chest compressions. But if you get there, the person is cold and you can't feel the breathing and the circulation, you can't feel it either. There's no point 
of doing. But yeah, if you find somebody you don't know anything else, you look it around and you can start the CPR right there. Um, begin CPR, try to prevent the injured person from become, becoming cold. The ground is always cold. So if you can put like something, sheets or something under jackets, under the person, uh, the, the temperature when we are laying down and when our body is in distress, the temperature goes down really fast. Um, burn kit. Oh, burning is so painful. What can we do? Have a lot of gauze and a lot of um, clean um, rags at home. Always in a safe place that if you need a lot of them, they are all clean and you know you can use them. Large volume, yes. Ceram wraps, yes, you can really hold fomentation in place or some medicine that you, you need to put gauze and wrap it around. The ceram wrap, it's not it's strong enough to cut circulation like duct tape. <laughs> and um, it, 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 it's really good to have handy. Cut the burn. It depends on what got burned on it, right? What kind of burn? Yeah. But I mean, I've just seen some people that, even like on a stove, they have a I've seen um, when the, the car racers are racing the cars and they have an accident, they don't see the fire. So the firefighters, when they get there, they cover the person with the, the thermal. It's, um, you know, that, that they use when you have the fires out there, the wildfires, it's a blanket. That, so if you can't see the fire, but you have that blanket, you can put that around. You can use flour. If it's in the kitchen, you can throw flour in there. If it's in a pan, you close the pan. Don't put water. Um, if it's in the skin, you roll yourself. If you are in the middle of the, the street, roll yourself in sand or in dirt. That, that will turn off the, fly, the, the fire. But if you have flour there, that's amazing. Yes. It stopped the pain, yeah. I had a steam burn, and, and I put clay on it, and it, and it took the burn away immediately. Oh, that's good. It, it, it probably didn't even leave a lot of scar. Yeah, the clay is really amazing. If you have the clay handy, or the, the um, it's psyllium charcoal that, and water that you make a mixture. Yeah, we will try to teach you that. I'm taking too long here, but it's something that it's always good to have in your freezer because that or the clay, you can just have it ready in the freezer. If something happened, you can apply that there. Um, so try to have at home the zinc oxide cream, lidocaine gel, or just water. If you have water, aloe, the, the aloe vera, it, it helps really fast too. Honey. Honey helps to not get infected because if it's a third degree burn that will go through the skin, it will get infected. Oh, yeah. So you can pour honey in there and uh, usually superficial burns hurt more. When it goes really deep down, thank God we don't feel a lot of pain, but it, it can get really bad infection. So you can pour honey in there. And, um, and then, of course, you go try to, to find help. Um, we have different stages. First degree is very superficial. Second degree, it's a little bit deeper. It goes in where we have the fat tissue. And uh, the third degree burn, it goes all the way down to our muscles. Bleeding, if you find somebody bleeding, what do you do? 
you try to stop, how you try to stop with pressure, how long. This one, you have to hold it for at least 10 minutes. Do not pick on it because then you have to start counting the 10 minutes again. So once you do the pressure, the compression, it really needs to hold on to it. We have different types of bleeding, bruises, laceration, puncture, abrasion, and avulsion. The main idea is we need to stop the bleeding. Apply pressure with a dressing. If you don't have anything, take the jacket, take whatever you can find there, apply pressure and hold. If you need to do a tourniquet, you have belt and the problem is right here and it's just squishing blood out. Yes. So grab the, the, uh, the belt and make a tourniquet here. And uh, if you have some way of writing it down in the skin, when first aid come to help, if you put the time that you put the tourniquet there, that will help them to know how long can you stay a tourniquet because you will try to stop circulation in that whole organ, in that whole member. Um, if, if you don't have anything, you can put pressure. You have duct tape, put duct tape. If you have crazy glue, <laughs> put crazy glue and try to put it together. If it's in the head, in the head, it's really hard to stop. What are you going to do? Stop circulation from the neck? Can't do that. Cayenne pepper? I never used that one. Um, uh, I, I will read about it, if cayenne pepper will stop. Uh, they have some powders that stop, but when it's something major, like uh, the femoral, and it's just gushing out, that in five minutes is gone. Yeah. So you really need to stop that bleeding. And uh, you can improvise a tourniquet, like they did over there, that you can really twist it with the pan. Um, uh, one thought about the, um, when you hit an artery, and even if you're not, and you're just close, but if, it's, if you see movement, that person can go into shock real quick, because it's actually, they're losing blood at a good pace. You'd be surprised. You really need to, like she's saying, you need to get that, that wrap on there and tie it up use a pencil, whatever, but I mean, you want to be careful, you don't want to do it too tight unless it's, if it is an artery or something and you're in the middle of nowhere, you know that it's going to be a while before life light gets there. If, if there is any Shop. internet connection or cell phone reception. Uh, yeah, it will show here. Okay, yeah, it will be uh, irresponsive. Okay, so, really um, if you find somebody like this, I had something. Oh, the head. How do we stop the bleeding in the head? Because the head, it goes really fast. The neck, it's really fast. So you can put a pressure there. You can tie with um, uh, the um, duct tape, not too tight, but at least to contain that blood. If it's in the head and the head gushes out really fast, so what you do, you don't have anything. You will use, you will put pressure, do the 10 minutes, do not pick on it. And then you will use the hair to pull it together. And somebody said, but what if I don't have, I don't have any hair? <laughs> you can use the crazy glue, but the thing is that how are we gonna find it? So what do you do? Yeah. and I will grab parts of the hair in one side of the wound, the other side of the wound, and I make knots, several knots, pulling it together. And if you have glue to put on top of that, then you put glue, because that will pull it together. That saved a lot of lives. It's crazy, I know, but it, it saves lives.
Um, that's how you do a big tourniquet that will really stop the blood. So you get a stick and the stick will help you put more pressure because uh, the pressure that we do with both of our arms pulling is not enough. Um, if you are working and it got a cut so big that every time um, you stop, it comes back bleeding again. So what you do, you try to clear that area really fast and then apply the glue and close it together and hold for a long time. You might glue your fingers with it too, but at least the, the bleeding stopped. <laughs> Yeah, the, the, um, that's why we, we try to write the time there when the first responders come. They will know usually about two hours will hold okay. But I, I don't know the person, but for me, I, I still would like to be alive if I, even if I lose a leg or an arm. <laughs> yeah. Not, not everybody thinks like this, but... At least we did something. Um, pressure, if the injury is in yourself, apply pressure. If the injury is in somebody else and you can't stop the bleeding, even after applying pressure and making a um, um, bandage, try to keep the member the same level as the heart or a little bit up because then the body will try to preserve the blood from going out in that direction. So because of gravity, the blood circulation will go more in the other members of the body instead of gushing out. Make sense? Yeah? No? <laughs> if you have any of those to clean a wound, use it. If you have to pour Clorox <laughs> to clean something, pour Clorox. Um, uh, vinegar, alcohol, witch hazel, and you need to do it fast, just pour it in there. Uh, the best way to clean the, the surgical uh, procedures that we had, sometimes we have to go and in the tribes around and we didn't have how to clean our equipment, we would use Clorox or uh, the powder laundry detergent. That would clean our equipment really, really well. It sterilize it. Um, how can you improv impro improvise a wound with duct tape? That's really cool too. Sometimes when you do that, the person will not even need sutures. It's called butterfly bandage, bandaid, bandage. And you can close a wound. Um, how you can use the crazy glue or how you call the crazy glue, super glue. It can stay in your body for about 10 days. After that, your body absorbs it. So you don't need to worry about it, as long as it's clean. <laughs> Tooth, huh? That can be really painful. There is a paste that you can do that will help. First, you need to make sure that you can decontaminate your mouth. So you can do a rinse with salty water. After that, you can make a paste to stop the pain. Is coconut oil, it's amazing. charcoal, peppermint oil, clove oil, and cayenne pepper. So you put that in a cotton ball, very small amount, and you put where it's painful. That will improve circulation, and it will cool down, and will pull the infection. So if you have an abscess there, the abscess will drain. And then after it drains, 
you wash your mouth, rinse your mouth, because you don't want that infection going anywhere else. Rinse your mouth with, with salt again or hydrogen peroxide. And uh, whew, it took me a long time. Sorry about that. We can go to, you can have a little break, and we can go there to do the poultice. Let's pray. Dear God, please help us, Lord. It's a lot of information, and we can go through so much, but we trust you, and we believe you. We know that you have a way out, and uh, everything you do is for our benefit, for our salvation. Please, Lord, help us to accept, to understand, and to come to you and surrender all to you, even if we don't want you. And um, please, Lord, help us to prepare and to get ready for emergencies and because we can help others too. And uh, please, Lord, we beg you that we can hear your voice very clear when the time comes. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.